All right. Good evening, everyone. This is the regular meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education here on Monday, November 14th at 7 p.m. at Downers Grove Village Hall. This meeting is being live streamed to the public at Village of Downers Grove YouTube channel. Melissa, will you please go roll? Member Doshi is absent. Member Ellis? Here. Member Hannes? Here. Member Harris? Here. Member Olsen? Here. Member Weiner? Here. Member Hughes? Here. Tonight, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment to the board later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to please pull out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These can then be placed in the basket over there to my right. Um, I have allotted 30 minutes tonight for public comment and ask everyone to keep it to three minutes apiece. All right, we're going to start off with the Pledge of Allegiance, and we'd like to welcome uh, Indian Trail School, so please welcome the Principal Ratner. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hi, good evening. We are really excited to be here tonight, and we are going to start off by introducing our student council co-sponsors. This is Katie Herkis and this is Taylor Carroll. Thank you. We have six officers here this evening that are going to share some about our student council. We're already impressed with the risks they've been willing to take and how much energy they're already looking forward to putting into this year. So we're going to turn it over to them. Hi. Hi. I'm Delaney Lawrence, and I'm the spirit chairperson some ways we are spreading spirit at Indian Trail are we just had our Red Ribbon Week to celebrate being drug free. We ended the week with some stickers. Another way we show spirit is on Monday we wear orange and on Friday we wear our school colors which are blue and yellow to show our school spirit. One thing that the student council is planning to do is a kindness week in February. I'm very excited for all the spirit days that we will have this year. After all, spirit is very important. Hi, my name is Rachel Bywater and I'm the Vice President of IT Student Council. At IT, we teach the students a lot of things that are helpful to them, like how to set goals for yourself, how to be kind and respectful, thinking about others, and how you can be your very best self. This year, we are working together to teach our students how to be respectful, responsible, and safe. When you walk into IT, you will see these three words as reminders in our hallways and classrooms. We are earning salient stars for all of these things we do. That's the way our teachers help all of us be respectful, responsible, and safe. Hello, my name is Kaylee Brady, and I am there this year's IT Student Council President. Kindness is a major focus of everyone at Indian Trail. We will be having a kindness week later in the year to focus on spreading kindness within our school community. We also recently had our first student council meeting where we made ornaments for Donners Grove Community Tree. Everyone should love Indian Trail because it is such a great school. There are many reasons why. One is because the teachers are very nice and help you when you need it. Another great thing is that everyone spreads happiness and kindness. We have fun activities and spirit days. Another thing that I like is Stallion Stars. Our amazing principal, Mrs. Ratner, made these up. The whole school tries to fill up the whole jar. Once we do, we get a prize like Pajama Day. You can earn one by helping out and being a good listener. This is why you should love our school. Hi, I'm Ethan Neidlinger Vogt, and I'm the treasurer of Indian Trail Elementary School Student Council. At IT, we are a community and we help each other. This can be seen by partners working together in the classroom. We have a grade level buddies and our PTA supports our students and staff. 
In addition to just kindergarten through sixth grade, our school is special because we have preschool and the RISE program. One reason I love being an IT stallion is because everyone feels safe and welcome. One of the ways we inspire at Indian Trail is that we inspire other students to do great things. Our friends help inspire our creative ideas. Our teachers help us inspire us to work hard, expand our mindset, and meet our personal needs. Our IT families help inspire us to stand up for ourselves, so show kindness, and are always accepting us. That's the way we and people around us help inspire other people. Organization. Hi, my name is Sanvi Kumbar and I am this year's Indian Trail Secretary. How we are organizing our student council is new this year. We have six officers, those of us here tonight. Each class has two representatives that attend our monthly meetings and we have mentors to keep our kindergarten and preschool classes in the know. We think that this will allow more students to be involved and giving back to our school. We are trying to have all of our meetings during lunch this year so that everyone has the opportunity to attend. There are lots of new things happening at IT this year. We have a new principal, Mrs. Ratner. She has lots of new ideas and one of the biggest changes is that we are earning silent stars and the rewards that go with them. We are hopefully getting a new playground. We are planning on we are planning a fundraiser in addition to lots of things that our PTA is doing. We have lots of new students. We have officers and student council for the first time in a while. We gave speeches and held a school-wide election, even got new iPads and new cases. These new things have all got our year off to a great start. Service. Hi, my name is Molly Nichols and my job is service chair. Something that we plan to do is help the West Suburban Humane Society by making dog or cat toys. We would also like to have a Pop Tad collection, collection to give to the Ronald McDonald House. We will be selling smencils so that we can donate the money we raise, we raise to our new playground fund. Finally, we are planning to focus on keeping our outdoor area more clean. We want to buddy up grades to focus on picking up trash. We would also like to work on finding ways to keep the baseball field cleaner. Thank you for inviting us here tonight to share about the Indian Trail Student Council. Thank you, you all did a wonderful job. I would like to introduce Mrs. Beth Johnson. She is our Indian Trail PTA president. And she's awesome. <laughs> We appreciate you having us tonight in the spotlight. Um, Ms. Ratner asked me to present briefly on some of the activities of the Indian Trail PTA. I forgot my team to bring with to share this presentation, but we'll follow up. So like many PTAs, we have three main missions, right? Supporting our students, partnering with our staff, and engaging our families, right? That's what every PTA's goal is at their school. And one of the ones I wanted to focus more on tonight was the fact of our engagement of families. Um, we have a slightly different population at Indian Trail, right? Our percentage of low income folks is higher than others. We have a transient population. So our goals are to make accessible um, activities for all families that are involved. We can't have things that cost hundreds of dollars to attend because we won't engage folks that way. And we recognize it. So these are some of the things we do throughout the year that is either low cost or no cost that the PTA supports. Of course, in addition to doing field days and book fairs and all the traditional PTA things. So we just wanted to point that out that we make a concerted effort to be able to do that for folks and families so we all can feel part of the community and not excluded because of finances. So transitioning to the effort we had to make for the playground fundraising, it was quite a challenge for Indian Trail um, luckily, 64% of the budget was funded by the state of Illinois grant. I wanted to take a minute to thank Kevin Bardo. He has been fantastic working with us um, over the last nine months. Very open, always meeting with us, helping us along. 
But despite the fact that we were put up to a challenge of raising more than we do in an annual, like our budget annually, to come up with, we've been very creative and have been able to do a lot of things over the last, what is it, three or four months. We had a golf outing, we had a bags tournament, we had a board and brush, an open play. The students had a lemonade stand, which raised over $2,500 in one afternoon, which was wow. awesome. Um, and of course, just the regular contributions and soliciting individual donations, right? So all of that to date raised us about 17,000. We still have about 22,000 to go. Um, the initial budget gap, as you see in the middle, would have been impossible for our school to raise. It would have been impossible for our families to contribute that much money. And so thank you to the board for making that decision to contribute towards the playground for the preschool, because as you know, we're unique. We have the preschool and K through six. We have the RISE program, and that's part of what your equity concern should be, right? How do you make it equitable so all schools can have a decent playground? And this was a great step towards that, because without it, we would not have come close to meeting our goals for the year. We do have some things coming up, so maybe you all want to contribute. We have a <laughs> big teacher night. Uh, the staff has been fantastic at Indian Trail. They are doing, uh, at McDonald's, doing a big teacher night to raise funds for us. We have the Got Sneakers Donation Drive. Um, Dr. Russell, I'm sure you have a lot of gym shoes with all your kids around. <laughs> I do. For us. We have an online raffle that's happening through November 20th. Some really cool packages like Bears tickets and a patio set, like these donations that people got. And of course, we have grants and individual contributions. We have about another six weeks or so to raise that last $22,000. we are hopeful. Um, but really, we wanted to thank you all for your support because our school, again, would not have been able to even come close to have a nicer playground starting for next year. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now on to the fun stuff. We're going to talk a little bit about Indian Trail data. So. As you can see, and you've probably seen from some of the other buildings as well, we have up on the screen um, some of our growth from last year. So when we are looking at this, you can see that overall, and this is according to our ECRA data, you can see that ELA school-wide, we um, were not, like we were close to making expected growth. Mathematics, we did make expected growth, so overall we were where we should be. But you do notice that our um, ELA is in the yellow, and so that is definitely an area that we've been talking about as a staff, and I'll share a little bit more about that. So this breaks it down a little bit further by grade level. So we have grades three through six. So if you see for math, we are um, in a place where we have some higher than expected growth, we have some expected growth, and then we have some lower than expected growth. But overall, again, we are in hitting that expected growth target for our grade levels in math, which is exciting, especially given the new curriculum that was put into place. When we look at our ELA, we are in an area where there is lower than expected growth. And so that's definitely been um, a place that we want to focus on as a school this year. And it is, at, it is written into our school SIP plan, which I'll be sharing. So these are just some examples of how we dig a little bit deeper into our data. So here is some of our ELA data from the um, IAR test. So you can see that um, we have green where kids are meeting or exceeding standards, but we have students in yellow who are getting to that target, and we have students that are below that target. And here are some examples of the areas when you look um, at the areas that IAR assesses. And vocabulary has been something that was um, was worked on last year during our SIP plan, so that's a piece that we are taking and carrying forward. And so here's an example, same thing in, in sixth grade. So what are we planning to do about this? So this year we are continuing to focus on the science of reading. And what's really great about it is that the district is also having a focus on science of reading. So we are kind of hitting it from two sides, learning about um, it from the district standpoint, but also we have some professionals in our building that are teaching us and um, working with us in order to help students in the area of reading. So this year, we are really working toward not only learning more about science of reading, but each grade level is writing a goal of where they want to go with the science of reading according to their own grade level data. 
And here's the why. So our AIMS web and MAP data, which is our benchmarking data, they do support the need for improved reading instruction across all grade levels. According to our ECRA data, like we saw in the spring of 2022, our school's overall growth in the area of reading is lower than expected. And we can see some of that particularly in the fifth and sixth grades. And we really feel strongly that if students are not getting the foundational skills in the primary grades, they are more likely to experience difficulty with more complex text at the intermediate grade levels. So here are some strategies that are part of our SIP plan. So as I mentioned, we're having professional development both from the district and from some of the reading specialists and interventionists in our own building. Each grade level is choosing an aspect of science and reading to dig a little bit deeper into. Today, actually, for our Professional Learning Monday, we worked on some assessments that we can give in order to find out where there are deficit areas with specific students. And we continue to maximize the support that we have in our building. Our intervention team is awesome. They are doing a wonderful job working with our students and also helping classroom teachers um, with strategies in their own classrooms. And we continue to service our students in small groups throughout the day. So obviously it's important when we're looking at our SIP goal to make sure that we're measuring, our, measuring what we're doing, making sure what we're doing is working and making sure that we have regular check-ins. So throughout the month of October, we really reviewed what was learned last year from the science of reading, just so we can get everyone back on the same page and um, understand why we're doing what we're doing. In November and December, the district is um, doing some training on the science of reading and just like I said today, we um, set some goals and learned about some assessments that we can give. As a building, we are checking in again in February to make sure that everyone is um, working toward their goals and to find out, especially after our benchmarking in the winter, where we are with our data. And then we do have ILT, which is our instructional leadership team. We do have meetings monthly where we check in on all three of our SIP goals. I also wanted to share that we are looking at behavior systems for our SIP goal, which is our second SIP goal. So we have really worked this year to make expectations across the building, not just in individual classrooms, so that students know what the expectations are in every area of the building. Students do earn stallion stars. There's an example of them up there when they are doing the expected behaviors in order to reinforce those behaviors. And it's been really fun to build community in our building. We did a glow lunch. We did a pajama day. What else have we done? Remind me. We did popsicles. We did a no homework pass. <laughs> yeah, so we did some fun things. And um, for our second semester, we are going to do a bingo board in each classroom where students can earn stallion stars and write their name in the bingo board. And then we'll call um, some squares every Friday. And an um, important aspect of what we're doing this year for our behavior data is really making sure that we track it. So looking at how many kids um, are experiencing difficulties or who I speak with um, or have an office discipline referral and talk about how, how we're talking to kids and how we're tracking that data in order to help kids succeed in our school. So that is it. Thank you so much. We appreciate it and we appreciate all of you for being here too to represent our school. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank Principal Anner. And we got a, a couple of gifts for you. So. Mrs. Jervis will come down and take care of that. Thank you for being here today. All right, listed on tonight's agenda are two communications received by the board. Are there any additional communications board members would like to share at this time? All right. That brings us to the spotlight on our schools, uh, school report cards. Welcome, Mr. Sissel. Good evening. Tonight we're going to just take a brief look at Illinois report card data. We're going to look at the state assessment data. We're going to talk about summative designations. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the percentile rankings, which is one of the new ways we're looking at measuring our success through ECRA. Um, as this is night three of four in board meetings that I'm presenting on data and these kinds of things, <laughs> this is going to be a summary level view, but there's a ton of information available both through the Illinois report card and at all of the individual school parent forums that I'll reference a little bit later tonight. So 
First, and though I know it's a little bit hard to see, the, the center picture there is what you see when you log into District 58's report card on IllinoisReportCard.com, and it just gives some overview information, 13 schools, 5% mobility, our summative designations, IAR growth, and then to the left is a, is a snapshot of all of the different places you can drill down and get more information. Tonight, we're really going to focus on our academic data, and then I'll just briefly touch on the equity journey continuum, knowing that we're going to talk about that more in depth a week from tonight. So when we look at the next screen, when you click on academic progress, we see a few things. First, we see our overall IAR proficiency in the upper left at 47% for ELA, 52% for math. Just below that is our total proficiency as a district, which includes students who would have taken an alternate assessment from the IAR based upon their individualized education plan. And so those numbers are just slightly different. We see the growth percentiles for IAR. We see the participation rates for the state assessment, which is IAR and DLM at the right. And science proficiency up at the top uh, right corner. Also, again, you'll see eighth grade passing algebra one, and just one version of a number of performance scatter plots where you can see different representations of the data as you click into that area. Again, one of the things we, we look most at this is we, this is where we do look for that final confirmation on what our percent of students meeting or exceeding on the IAR, that's what, that, that's what they call proficiency. As a reminder, the state has designated level four or five out of the five levels of performance as proficiency for that assessment. IAR growth is calculated by the state in a couple of different ways. This is still, the, the, at the, at, at the bottom line, they take a student at the individual level and say, what was my previous score, and then compare my actual score to all of the other students in my grade level that had the same previous score. So that's a, a real quick way of how they, and then that becomes by ranking that, each student has an individual growth percentile based on that, and therefore any group of students then has a growth percentile as well. For the summative designations, they calculated the the distance against the 2018-19 cohort across the state, because that's the last time there has been consistent data across the state. However, for the school report card, they calculated IAR growth against the 2021 cohort of students, which is consistent with what the school report card has done for many years, which is why the state chose that. However, for us, Remember that we took that 2021 assessment actually in the fall of 2021, in the next school year, because in the spring of 2021, we had just made all of the preparations to bring our students back on site for a longer day, and we chose not to devote the first 14 to 20 hours of that new experience to state assessment. We pushed it to the fall. So we have no historical data to say how would our students have done compared to a fall administration of the IAR. The vast majority of Illinois did administer that assessment in the spring of 2021. So just another sort of asterisk in all of the data that we have as we go forward. When we look at ECRA, remember, they're, calcula they're calculating IAR growth based on individualized student projections based on past performance, local norms, and considering that range of growth. And so, again, we don't want to dismiss the state's calculations because they are there and they are accurate in that method. We also just want to recognize that we have committed to looking at growth in different ways in District 58. And so this is previously presented data, but just as a reminder, this is what our IAR growth looked like via the ECRA platform for the 2021 school year in the spring in mathematics and in ELA. There's a lot of numbers on these slides, but one of the things we talk about is who, who would we compare ourselves to locally. And so we've spent a lot of time over the past couple of years talking about comparisons to large elementary districts in DuPage County. So that's what's on this screen, is those districts. This is sorted by math proficiency, and so you can see that we kind of, we kind of fall third in the pack when we look across the board. And ELA proficiency is actually very similar, would be fourth if we sorted it that way. It's worth noting some of the other statistics that do have statistically impact on some of these things. The um, low income percentages kind of grow as we descend. Mobility rate grows as we descend. And also just looking at some of the per pupil expenditures and where we are at versus where perhaps 181 is that you know has a, a, a different uh, proficiency level than we do. 
and again, a lot here, so this is all publicly available, but I won't dissect every piece of it. The next comparison is just the District 99 group, so these are all of the elementary districts that send students to District 99. And again, this puts us you know, in, in at, the, at the top of the pack in terms of math proficiency. It would put us about third in terms of ELA proficiency. And again, you can see some of those growth percentile numbers vary a little bit by district. I, I, I keep going back to that fall IAR assessment was something we had never done before, and so when compared to that assessment where we had more instruction and it was a different period of time, the growth numbers are a little bit different perhaps than, the, than all of these other schools who did administer the IAR in the spring of 2021. Summative designations this year of our 13 schools, we have 12 schools designated as commendable and one school, which is Hillcrest, designated as exemplary. Ironically, some of you may recall that in the fall of 2018, the first time these came out, we had 12 schools designated as exemplary and Hillcrest alone designated as commendable. So some interesting, you know, full circle or something. And again, it, it comes down to, as we'll look in the, and we've talked about in the slides, just where that all falls in the state and, and what that looks like. As this is just a reminder that we've talked about previously what goes into those calculations. Again, ELA and math growth as calculated by the state, the chronic absenteeism pieces and the climate survey, the proficiency targets and all of that. And really, you know, as we've looked at some of the individual schools data, I talked at the last uh, board meeting about some of those bonus points that were given for chronic absenteeism if it dropped from, for in 2022 from 2019. Even the climate survey getting full participation, we wouldn't have necessarily prioritized after a student returned from an extended absence, making up the state climate survey, right? We, you know, we give it in school when kids are there, but it hadn't necessarily been a priority for us to, to make that up. There are a couple of schools that if they had had a few more students take that climate survey, the score, the numbers they would have gotten actually might have tipped over the rating. And, and again, that's just something to reflect on. I think the instructional decision making is sound, and I think we can know going forward that if you know we, we can think about then prioritizing makeups for that survey as an example of just ways to be aware of how this will be presented. So as I mentioned earlier, we've presented um, 11 parent forums thus far. We have Indian Trail on Wednesday night and Hillcrest on, excuse me, and Highland on Thursday night, and then we will have completed the 13 school tour. Um, I appreciate all of the building principals participation in these and preparing information. So we post also all of the very specific building level data in AmesWeb, in MAP, and also in all of the categories that lead up to these index scores. And so at the right is that final number out of 100 that the state calculates to give what they call that, that all student group index, which it is what yields the rating. You can see at the bottom, the exemplary threshold for this year is 82.28. We have one school that tipped over that. We have three schools that are within one whole point of 82.28. And all of our schools really are within striking distance in one way or another of that target, but it, it's not necessarily a target that we set for ourselves every year. As I said, we've had years where we had 12, commend or 12 exemplary schools. This year we have 12 commendable schools. I think it really has to do with looking at the data as we continue to analyze it locally. And again, you can see even in 2019, that exemplary threshold was 80.12, and so that, that changes year to year as we go. Just a quick glance at the equity journey continuum. This is all that's available on the Illinois report card relative to the equity journey continuum. It shows the three areas that ISBE has designated, student learning, learning conditions, and elevating educators, and then it indicates where District 58 is. Again, remember, based on 2018-19 data, because that's the last time the state had that full data set to analyze in this way. And it shows us squarely in the, the, the small gaps in equity to minimal gaps in equity range, depending on what's there. So at first glance, that is overall encouraging. What we'll take some time with next week is to unpack a little bit of the, the data that's beneath some of those things, again, which isn't publicly available, but just to get a better sense of both what is placing us in those categories from, from prior year's data, and if there are areas that we can focus some attention on. But we'll spend, much, we'll spend time on that again next Monday. Jason, can I pause you for one yeah, second? Absolutely, Greg. Um, going back to the previous slide about on uh, summative designations. Yep. Does the state compare all case or all third through eighth graders in the same pool? So, like, are, are the cutoffs for exemplary and? Uh, and underperforming the same for middle schools and for elementary schools? Yes, elementary. it's an elementary middle school group and it's a high school group. That's how they do the rankings. So, well, yes, that's in this case, yes, that's how they do the rankings. So Is the there a reason why they're comparing middle schools against elementary? Like, for example, like why, why all of our middle schools are in the same pool as 
I don't know if there's a specific reason other than they've just broken it down. I mean, really, they yeah, actually usually use the terminology elementary and high school, okay. but the middle schools fall into the elementary for what makes up the summative designation. And then just one other point, too, as we discussed at the curriculum workshop, these summative designations are, are tough to follow from year to year because the criteria, although it was supposed to stay the same, has changed this year. And so, you know, we've talked about that attendance bonus point during the pandemic. So the rules do appear to be shifting a little bit in the middle of this when, when we weren't aware of that. So it's just another point of clarification I wanted to make. The next few slides come from an ECRA webinar that, came, that was presented after the report card data came out. And you know we've already aligned with this in, in terms of our achievement key performance indicator, which is to bring this back around. You know, they shared some of the reasons that it is, it's beneficial to look at, rather than raw data, to really look at those percentile rankings across the state in terms of thinking about how we do things. Percentiles are, are, are simple and things that we are very familiar with consuming. They gave the example of height charts and growth charts and things like that. It, it's not necessarily about what the actual number is, it's about what is that in terms of a percentile ranking of any group of, of people. We talked about the fact that those numbers are empirical, and this is an actual data point that, that John Gatta used. If you look at Illinois, in eighth grade ELA for last year, 30% of students in Illinois are, are saying to have met standards. In other words, 30% of students across the state met or exceeded standards on the Illinois Assessment of Readiness in English Language Arts, got a four or a five. That's the bar that the state has set. So one way you can look at that is, well, 70% of our students are not on grade level. But then when you compare that, when you take that same group of students and look at them at the national assessment, which to be fair doesn't sample every single student in the nation, but is one of the only national comparisons we have, Illinois eighth graders are in the 86th percentile on that assessment. And so it's just two very different stories when you think about how that can be interpreted. Certainly across all of our data, we want to be looking at it honestly, but we also want to make sure that we are giving appropriate context to all of that. Percentiles then are also comparable. So where you have very different raw data as you look at different things, you can say for any of these things that we collect statewide, we can talk about the percentile and make that a simple comparable thing. And so one of the pieces of analysis that they give us is our district percentile for numerous factors. And so we had looked at the left-hand side of this, our district value for ELA and math proficiency and the percentile across the state when we established our key performance indicators. In fact, we looked back at these benchmarks and said, for ELA, our target was going to remain the 75th percentile statewide, but for math, because our prior performance had been so much higher, we raised the bar on ourselves and set that at the 85th percentile. If you look toward the right, where we have the 2022 district values and district percentiles, you can see that for ELA, we are at the 84th percentile in the state, and for math, we're at the 94th percentile in the state. Our math proficiency actually went up as a district, but if you know our ELA proficiency has, is not quite at the 2019 level, and yet even being below that with our actual number of meets and exceeds, as compared to the rest of the state, we've increased by 9%. And so, do we still want to see the meets and exceeds numbers go up? Absolutely, we do. That's work we continue to do. We want to see that move in the right direction. But contextualizing this, I think, is important. One other interesting piece that is on this screen is our participation rates and where that puts us in terms of percentile in, in the state. And it's just one of those, it, we, have, we have made tremendous strides in District 58, well surpassing the 95% participation mandate by the state. But just to recognize that even having 98.3% of students participate still puts us in the, in, the, in the lower third of the state in terms of participation overall. <coughs> And then we have, and I realize this is a little difficult to see on the screen, but just looking at, again, our key performance indicators that have, you know, we have put in place, we'll be looking primarily in this coming spring to see how we did, but this is, compares our 2019 percentage of meets and exceeds and what that means for percentiles versus our 2022 percentiles of students meeting that proficiency and where that places us. And so just a quick analysis says that, you know, our, our range in 2022 is much tighter, has, has come up in ELA, and we have nine of our, of our 13 schools are at or above that 75th percentile of students meeting or exceeding. We saw our district number is in the 84th percentile, but individual schools, we have nine at or above the 75th percentile. And then the last side is the same for math. As a district, we're in the 94th percentile. We have nine schools at or above the 85th percentile this year, and a range from the 68th to the 96th percentile. Again, this is when we rank all of the schools across the state. In this case, 
to Member Harris's earlier question, the percentile rankings are done differently by ECRA. So there's an elementary school district ranking and then there is a middle school district ranking. So those of you with sharp eyes will notice that some of the numbers for the middle schools don't exactly align to the numbers for the elementary school. Herrick, for example, on this screen is at 48.1% meeting or exceeding, which doesn't put it in order of meets and exceeds, but that puts them because it's a middle school comparison in the 92nd percentile across the state. So again, that's the extent of the data I, I was planning to review tonight. There, each school has that individual form on their website where we've drilled down into all of the specifics that go into these categories. And um, that's available on websites and again at the, at the parent forums. So after you did all this, right, you're, you're, you're taking data from multiple sources, we're, we're changing the rules of the game from the states, you know, it's, it's kind of, you, you did a lot of work here, like what takeaways did you have that kind of influence your decision making with, with your team and, and kind of the teams across the, the district? I think, you know, at the highest level, I think what, what this tells us is that what we are, we are we are experiencing, and it's kind of what ECRA told us in the, in the fall, we are back to expected growth levels. And so even you know, as we are looking at where our students have come over the past couple of years, we are not seeing that, that same level of dip that the rest of the state is. I think that's what the percentiles tell us. You know, we are, even in places where our achievement in the IAR is, is, is static or even slightly lower compared to the rest of the state, our students have, have begun to recover more quickly and, and that's exciting. I think that is something to celebrate. I think in terms of decision making, what, what do, how do we respond to this data? It's been really exciting to hear each of the principals, you heard Principal Ratner tonight, but to hear them prepare for these parent forums and really identify what has already happened. You know, we didn't wait until we saw these rankings or the designations. This was all part of the school improvement planning process that, you know, you've heard us say for years, when that process becomes more robust, we're going to have more direct responsiveness to this data and it really is coming to life. And I, each of our 13 principals is in great command of their school's data, their school improvement plan goals, and, and tangible, actionable things that are happening in the building that relate to those goals. So I think, you know, it's, it's, it's almost a, you know, this doesn't, at a building level, tell me anything we didn't already know. It's not really new data. The new piece is the, is the designations and, and, and the ECRA percentiles. But in terms of responsiveness to the data, it's what's been happening at the building level for the past six to eight months. And it, it, really, it really is exciting to see that take hold in a meaningful way. When you look at just resource allocation, you know, taking it from a district lens and kind of focusing it on individual buildings. If I look at Indian Trail, ELA, so they're in the 61st percentile, whereas Leicester is the 90th. How do you kind of look at um, resourcing and kind of helping that 61 become that 90? So if, I'm assuming by resource allocation we're talking people. Generally, yeah. Because that's mean, generally like, our re the resource so, we have. So it sounds like, you know, we're, obviously each school has its own challenges that, that we, we do our best to address. But as you kind of see data coming in that shows that wide of a, of a range of performance or achievement in, in this case, mm -hmm. how do you kind of look at how do we help boost up others that may not, may not be performing at, the, at that highest level that we're seeing? Sure. So, I mean, I, again, it is part of it is that tier one school improvement planning, like what do we need to focus on in this building that will help raise student achievement overall, which will promote growth as well. In terms of resource allocation, we spend considerable time each winter looking across all of the schools in the district, looking at the students who are identified in tier two or tier three, which place them as, as them academically at risk or in need of support, as well as students who have been identified with IEP minutes. And we spend, I would say, several hours, you know, looking at that information and working to come up with a way to equitably allocate those resources across schools. And so we have actually seen increases in certain schools of intervention positions and things like that over the past few years based on that information. So I think that's, you know, that, and that data, it's not exactly looking at it from, from this, this data set. We really look at that from the individual student needs, which should reflect in, you know, larger scale data like this. Okay. And Steve, just to, you know, kind of piggyback off of Justin's comments, I think when you look at it across the board, when you look at the deliberate approach um, we've done as a district with math in particular, in, in being very um, you know, prescriptive and working with our staff for professional development and centering uh, coaching, 
that has really started to bear fruit as we look at our numbers. When we look at ELA, we've also seen some gains, but certainly that is a focus area this year with our teachers in talking about identifying issues, you know, or um, concerns across schools and then across grade levels. One of the other things that is really picking up momentum in the district with Justin and Jessica Stewart is um, so many of or so many of these come down to individual students in how they may or may not be performing which each student is obviously a little bit different and so taking a look at our MTSS system and what supports do we have in place for each student who's below grade level and how can we help those students whether that's through math intervention whether that's through reading intervention whether that's through more time in tier one you know all of those things that's also taking place in the school improvement uh, data reviews and so you know to, to answer your question another thing that we have to continue to do is to look at each individual student and taking a look at the interventions that are in place and are they the right interventions are we seeing success why or why, why or why not and then changing accordingly as, as we go through that so that's another thing um, and that's why the shift from RTI to MTSS is taking place to really get better and better at that as we move along well I guess uh, how would you view that from your position right like one school is performing 50% better than yeah. another well I think there's a lot of factors that that play into that I think one of the things with IAR data um, that we have to take a look at is um, you know mobility rate how long have kids been in our system certainly there is a difference between kids that start with us in kindergarten and finish with us in eighth grade versus students who move in and so when you have a building that is going to have a lot of students moving in and out of it it's not surprising to see the overall achievement level down it doesn't mean that they're not learning and growing but we do know when students move the research is clear you know usually puts them about six months behind uh, some of their peers so mobility plays a, a, a piece into that I don't think we'll ever be in a situation as a school district of course we want all of our schools to achieve at the highest levels but when you have schools where students um, you know may have a higher percentage of low-income status or a higher percentage of mobility the research is, is pretty clear in terms of the correlation and academic performance so what we want to make sure that when we get students how do we work with families to keep them in the same building and then continue them in our system because what we do know with our data is the longer kids are in our system the higher they perform and so that's another factor that plays into that that we look in that we certainly don't just say well this kids moved three times so therefore they're never going to be able to achieve we do work with them and try and close those gaps that's why the state has shifted to more of a growth model and we're shifting to more of a growth model because we want to know when that student was with us did we make a year's worth of growth in a year's time and if we're not doing that then what interventions do we have in place that's where we start looking at even things like summer school uh, the last several years we've started giving students access to free summer school um, if they're not able to close that gap we've used some of the ESSER money for that so those are some of the things that we take a look at as we're going through um, but again what interventions are in place do we need to change those interventions do they need to become more intense when we're getting down to the student level that's what it looks like and it is different for every student every student um, for reading for example one student may have a decoding issue another student may have a comprehensive or a comprehension issue you know we really have to work with our specialists in those areas thank you thank you anybody else thank you Justin thank you, thank you. All right, that brings us to the reports to the board. First up is going to be Dr. Russell with the superintendent's report. All right, I apologize in advance. It's a little lengthier than my last couple, but um, we have a lot of things to uh, talk about. First off, the successful passage of a referendum. Last Tuesday, the District 58 community voted on the district's $179 million bond proposal. The referendum passed with approximately 67% of voters supporting the measure. I want to thank all the community members, staff, and board members who participated in the facility planning and engagement process for their hard work over the past several years, really the, the past several decades. This work helped determine the referendum question and place it on the ballot for our community. This involves several community meetings, the creation of a, street, a strategic plan goal, a citizen task force surveys, and several other <coughs> engagement opportunities. There's a great deal of work that needs to be done moving forward, and the district will continue to update the community. Additionally, we will work with our established committees to ensure transparency and fiscal responsibility moving forward. Thank you again to the community for its overwhelming support and faith in the school district. Uh, this is an exciting time for District 58, but a lot of work uh, needs to take place. 
I also want to highlight the school board. On Wednesday, November 2nd, the Board of Education was one of only 33 districts in Illinois to earn the IASBs, that's the Illinois Association of School Boards, um, Top Governance Recognition Award. On behalf of all of us in District 58, thank you to the Board of Education for their hard work, sacrifice, and dedication. It was an honor being with the board when they received that award, and congratulations. Tomorrow is November 15th. That marks the official statewide observance of School Board Member Day in Illinois. Each year, this day is an opportunity to show support for your Board of Education and the individual school board members who are committed to providing a local voice for educational decisions. I'll kind of cut the, the whole thing short, but you know, um, school board members are unpaid volunteers, and it is a great deal of effort, especially uh, during the pandemic in the last several years. Um, it is not an easy thing to sit up on this dais. Um, at least the superintendent gets compensated for his time to sit up here, but I really do want to thank not only this board, but all the boards in District 58. Um, while board members or boards may have differences they all ever since I've been a, a teacher in the school district everyone always is attempting to do what they think is best for kids and that's a huge compliment and so I do want to take some time to um, you know celebrate board member recognition day which is tomorrow and thank the Board of Education uh, for your service so at your seat you will find a uh, certificate from the Illinois Association of School Boards uh, recognizing that so uh, thank you again on behalf of a grateful um, staff and a grateful community for all that you do because it's not an easy job all right I also want to have a celebration although he's not here tonight I want to congratulate Leland Wagner on successfully completing his doctoral degree uh, dr. Wagner is the principal of Pierce Downer and I believe he's out celebrating with his family right now but that's also <laughs> a, uh, a very good accomplishment and um, one that we want to celebrate publicly so congratulations to dr. Wagner uh, we are going to skip the curriculum instruction report. Uh, Justin just gave his, and uh, Todd has a bunch of finance stuff coming up, so we're going to skip that <laughs> as well. In terms of personnel, I just want to let the community and the board know that the district has begun the process to fill two very important administrative vacancies for next school year due to the well-deserved retirements of Dr. Jane Uzentis, our Assistant Superintendent of Personnel, and Matt Durbala, O'Neill Middle School Principal. The district will conduct multiple rounds of interviews for each position, and hiring teams will include representatives uh, from all stakeholder groups. We hope to name the next Assistant Superintendent for Personnel at the December or January board meeting, and we hope to name the next O'Neill Middle School principal at the February or March board meeting which would be consistent with our previous uh, timeline so again we want to thank both Jane and Matt for all that they have done and will continue to do and uh, just let the community know that uh, we are filling uh, positions like we normally do in terms of technology I want to highlight uh, some great work done by Dr. Ike Miller which will be a huge savings to the district last spring the district learned that we would be receiving a new private fiber optic network to connect our schools this network will come at no cost to the district with funding from both the state and federal governments. Over the summer, inside work was completed, and as of today, outside work on school property is completed in all but two schools. In fact, I think if you check Twitter, there's an actual picture out there that James put out. Over the coming months, you may notice uh, Terrazon Group trucks working throughout our schools and district boundaries. These fiber contractors are working on installing this fiber network, which we hope will be fully operational before the end of the school year. Once complete, this network will provide us with increased performance and save us over $100,000 in cost per school year for many years to come. So great work on that, James. Thank you. In terms of student services, I want to just give a special thanks to our preschool team. Um, preschool is the one um, or, or this couple of grade levels that has a mandatory audit every or every so often from the uh, State Board of Education where they come in and observe the teachers. Our preschool team, both at Henry Puffer and Indian Trail, just finished that. I know we have Tracy from Indian Trail here, but I, I do want to thank our uh, preschool director, Susan Dillon, and Jessica Stewart, who oversees the program. Um, it's a lot of work to go through that kind of an audit, especially with someone looking at you as you're doing it the whole time, and they did a really nice job. For those of you who don't know, our preschool program is a gold-rated program which is the highest rating you can receive from the state board and so we're very um, happy to go through another audit and uh, we welcome uh, the findings which will uh, become available in the fall in terms of public relations it's hard to believe it's that time of year but district 58 invites the community to participate or volunteer at the Grove Express 5k on Thanksgiving morning in downtown Downers Grove uh, this community event replaced the bond field 5k last year and proceeds will be split among the education foundation of district 58 the Downers Grove Rotary Club and the Roadrunner Soccer Club to learn more you can check out the website groveexpress.com 
Also, just another thing in public relations, and this is perfect timing because tomorrow we're supposed to get our first measurable snow. Uh, District 58 will send out its annual winter weather communication tomorrow to all families. This message will also be sent in Wednesday's Communicate 58. Families, please review this information so that you're prepared in the event school is called off or a remote learning day is called. It is definitely that time of year already. Facilities. Attached to the business office report is a review of the playground work that has been done throughout the district. Playground updates, uh, though part of the master facilities plan, were not included in the referendum funds. District 58 has been very fortunate that both members of the community have stepped up and Representative Salva Murray assisted us with, with grants. Um, over a million dollars in state funding is another great opportunity for grants. So there's a lot of work going on in this summer. While you might not see all the referendum work starting yet because of the public bidding process and the design process, we will certainly be um, really trying to finalize a lot of our playground work so we can get that done before we move forward with uh, the referendum. And I'm going to end uh, by wishing everyone in the District 58 community a very happy Thanksgiving. Our team is truly grateful that we get the opportunity to work with the student staff, families, board members, and community members of the district. So happy Thanksgiving. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Any uh, questions or comments? Yeah, uh, Dr. Ross, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, when you talked about the, the work ahead for now that the referendum is passed and, 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 and a lot of the hard work is really starting in, in, in earnest now. Can you share with me your vision for how you see the district um, reaching out and collaborating with the community around a vision for how, for take for example, the expansion of both middle schools, how we're going to get uh, community feedback, mm -hmm. uh, not just from our community, but from our staff and from our students and so on, uh, in terms of how we want that space to look. Yeah, that's a great question. So a lot of the feedback, um, we've already started that process, right? Over the last several years, whether that is through surveys, the, the community engagement process, the citizen task force, um, that helped us lead to the initial designs. Well, now that the referendum has passed, now we have to sit down with our architects and our uh, construction management firm that will be up for approval. And we've got to finalize that design process. So there'll be um, some opportunities for micro community meetings. And what I mean by that, one of the things that attracted us to the construction management firm was their willingness to meet with neighbors and talk about the impact that uh, the construction may have in their particular neighborhood. So that's a good example of that. Um, the other thing though, that as we finalize the design process, the Board of Education will be the ultimate group that approves the final designs and approves the construction that's going to take place. But we certainly want to continue to gather feedback in several forms. And so first and foremost, because this is still part of the strategic plan, goal number three, the district leadership team will have a huge role. And the district leadership team is a very appropriate group to get a lot of that feedback and to bounce ideas off our architects and construction management firm because it's representative of families, two board members, um, and every employee group that we have. So that's one way that we want to continue to do that. Then, depending on the situation, we're also going to be seeking feedback from other established committees. So the FAC, the Financial Advisory Council, that's a great group that we want to bring back a lot of the financial things to to make sure we're on target. The Superintendent's Community Advisory Council will help advise me on whether we're hitting the target with public engagement. Do they feel they have enough information? And then of course, just like District 99 did, there will be several opportunities for informational sessions prior to board votes on important topics like middle school design where we can gather feedback from our staff and we can gather feedback from the uh, community. While many of the designs aren't going to allow for significant changes, let me give you an example of that, HVAC, right? That's not something we can go back to the community and say, okay, who would like the pipe to go over here? Or who would like this to be here? You know, that, that's kind of already baked into the cake. There are certain things like when we design the gymnasiums or the libraries, that's certainly what we want to hear from our staff to make sure they're functioning. Um, when we design science labs, we want to hear from staff in the community. Is this what, are we hitting the right mark before we ask the board to approve those? So there will be engagement opportunities and they'll be very similar to, you know, the community forums that we held before. Thank you. Just to kind of follow up uh, on that as well, one of the things I think is going to be really important as, as we move forward on this, since we're talking about this right now, is the communication process of exactly what the timeline would look like. I think one of the things we heard about in this process is everyone wanted to kind of know exactly what this arc would look like, but until we kind of got here, we couldn't iron that out until we got working with the construction management firm and the architect, and obviously supply chains and everything. That, like, we may want to prioritize one thing, but supply chains might tell us to prioritize another thing. So I think making sure communicating and, and 
Uh, I think there's a lot of excitement around it when you sort of get people that say, all right, we trust you and, and we're going to um, trust you with this amount of money. One of the things that they look for is for us to kind of explain now yeah. what that process is going to look like. So uh, I know it's going to take us um, a little bit of time here to kind of get our footing and get everybody kind of working, but that's one thing I'm looking forward to is getting that, that communication out and really kind of sharing that information as well. Yeah, such a great point, and I was just talking with our architect firm uh, on the phone today about this very topic, <coughs> right? And, and so one of the things is, is to make sure sooner rather than later, and we're in the process of doing this, once the construction management firm gets approved, we want our construction management firm and our architect to sit down and to talk about reasonable time frames and when do we think we can get things accomplished so then we can put that out to the community about you know here's the batting order so to speak and this is how we're going to go through those one of the, the fairest questions i got in our community engagement sessions well what's the priority or which one goes first right and i had to answer that very honestly to say you know a lot of it is going to be dependent on the supply chain the availability of labor when we're able to accomplish those things but that is certainly one of the first things that we have to do in this process because then we have to go out and publicly bid and do all those things so over the next several months that is exactly the work that we're going to be doing and communicating that out to our family so then they know if there's a particular area of focus that they want to you know give us feedback on they'll have the opportunity to do that and, and another aspect of that is um, is dependencies, right? You know, like there are certain projects we can't do until we do until we do our electrical. We can't do HVAC, you know, Correct. things like that. So, uh, making sure that we continue to communicate that I think is going to be incredibly important. So, thank you. Anybody else? Any other comments, questions? All right, Mr. Dreyfus, um, the monthly business and treasurer's report. I'm glad you brought up electricity. The first thing is transformers. Yes. Yeah. Uh, um, before I get to the action items that I'll talk about a little bit, uh, we have uh, on your monthly report, your year-to-date report, uh, operational things are moving along uh, as as expected. Uh, Revenue is coming in. Um, you you've got the four. We we are going to. If you look at the uh, revenue side on uh, interest income, when we projected that out, uh, I think that was three Fed rate increases ago or something like that, um, you know, we will probably hit 100% before end of calendar year, uh, which would be six months into the fiscal year. Um, so because of the other items on the agenda and because of um, what the voters approved on uh, Tuesday night, uh, you know that you'll have an amended budget uh, at some point at the year end because we'll have uh, adjustments uh, according to what we had planned and anticipated uh, when we had the referee you on know, the, the budget up to what will be actual at the end so we'll make those adjustments but overall we're in a good position uh, revenue and expense wise uh, comparative to uh, previous years and, and where we are in a normal normal year um, there's one thing uh, we wanted to, to bring up because as we're getting into the conversation of the next steps after the referendum um, during COVID, we had 27 containers on property for storage of things that we couldn't have uh, in the buildings. Uh, we're down to three. So as we whittle those away and, and get down to the, to the bare minimum um, for someday having the next trailer, which will be a construction trailer, at our sites as we do, uh, do work and, and updates to all of our buildings. So that's exciting. We've been, um, the operations department has been working through uh, with our teams at our buildings and, and reducing those as well. This is also tomorrow is the last day for open enrollment. So any employees that are listening or watching, please, you know, uh, we have a few more to people to go through. But this has been our open enrollment for insurance. Uh, it's been very positive. We were out to, I think, seven or eight different uh, buildings as well as a couple virtual uh, meetings and we've been answering a lot of email and uh, phone call questions going through that so we're excited about finishing that up. <coughs> um, you have on your um, as as promised a couple months ago uh, when the board uh, went through and prioritized uh, the companies um, for construction management uh, we said we would bring back at this meeting uh, provided there was a, a, a favorable vote, um, a contract, a base contract. Uh, and that is what you have in your documents this evening uh, for construction management uh, for the, the, the top pick that uh, we had ranked as number one of Bully and Andrews. Um, 
and so that is before you that is uh, helped it was prepared and worked on uh, with them and with our uh, legal firm Hodges Louisi uh, to come up with the baseline piece there will be addendums uh, to that contract as we work through the process and develop the structure system that gets into the little more detail of what parts become a project and you know does that include all of the additions and in, in, in the middle schools as one project and that type of thing uh, as we get into the nuts and bolts <clears throat> so getting into uh, as we stated as dr. Russell pointed out um, the uh, election uh, the referendum did pass by 67 uh, percent one of the pieces that we have talked about and been very um, straightforward with the community and managing expectations of we won't have air conditioning in schools uh, in August of 23 um, it will take some time uh, the next steps are you know working on that process and getting uh, everyone working towards building drawings uh, and so forth to do that we need to have some funds and we need to, to start that and, and, and move that process up given volatility of market um, it's advantageous to do that uh, sooner rather than later and, and, and reduce interest rate risk to that end we have an agenda um, that we have uh, before you two resolution parameter resolutions for the board uh, to move that to the next steps um, where they will be going out uh, and, and starting to, to market and, and sell those bonds. Uh, we have two uh, rating agency meetings uh, set up uh, for tomorrow. Uh, we are going to be presenting to Standard and Poor's uh, and to Moody's um, tomorrow morning and afternoon. Um, we've had those set for some time and um, that is our next step moving forward by the end of November we will uh, be pricing the bonds and developing and having those come into sale uh, a couple of the things we wanted to point out to make sure is that um, they're tax exempt bonds as such uh, and under the state of Illinois uh, we have to have a reasonable expectation of spending what we're going to borrow initially in a three-year period we've developed kind of a rough sketch as to what that is uh, and so therefore our first initial number even though the parameters resolution is a full 70 179 it's probably going to be significantly less than that it's probably going to be somewhere in the about 120 million dollar range um, as the first issuance because as we've talked about we won't be doing heavy heavy construction next summer where we'll be spending 10 or 15 or 20 million dollars like we will do the following in the in the summers after that um, so that makes that adjustment as to what we think we're going to spend in those two in the next three um, as to what our ask will be in the initial piece so we'll be breaking this up into two uh, our expectation right now is into two separate uh, uh, sales one that will happen uh, quite quickly here uh, by end of calendar year uh, and then one that will happen down the road as we work through our process and you know we work on a monthly basis with reporting to the board and you know as well as with the FAC as to when it comes time uh, to borrow those those funds and to go through this again uh, with the marketing and so forth so we try to limit it to a number every time you go out and do a marketing <coughs> and, and a bond sale there is obviously there's costs to that we try to minimize those uh, but in this case um, you know it's just that what the law requires and what our time frames are for how we um, how we're going to work through that with that is there any questions on as far as the issuance any questions from okay no I feel like we've had a thousand <laughs> the FAC we've had a thousand conversations yeah we've yeah we've uh, yeah the FAC went through this in a little yeah. more detail and 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 you know in the conversation as to how we we're you know working this through so no, I appreciate it, and and we got all your memos and everything else. So thank you. All right, appreciate it. Thank you. All right, the legislative committee has not met since our last meeting. Uh, I'm sorry, the policy meeting group has not, but the legislative committee has. They met on October 26. Uh, Dr. Russell. Yeah, um, I'm going to give the update on behalf of uh, 
Member Hannes and Member Ellis. Uh, we, it's that time of year as we go to the I conference, uh, which is this weekend. Uh, at the I conference, there's an opportunity um, to have a delegate from the board uh, vote on resolutions or action items that the IASB wants to take. Um, just to be clear for the community, these are not um, resolutions that turn into law. They are more of ad advocacy statements or you know, to the mission and vision of the Illinois Association of School Boards, but we do think it's a good thing that they let their members weigh in on those. And so um, on uh, the action items today, uh, under the consent agenda, which is our typical format, you will see what those resolutions are. They are much shorter this year. I think in previous years we've had north of 20. This year I believe it's eight or nine. Um, and uh, they did include, though, in the report of the uh, resolutions, which are submitted by member districts, and then there's a board that you know determines whether or not they're going to move those forward at ISB. Um, they did include all of those, but very few of them made it all the way uh, through. And so we, what we do as a legislative committee is we take a look at these. We, we look at the rationale of the district that submitted them, and then we look at the rationale of the IASB board that is saying whether or not to you know, adopt that resolution or not adopt this. We had some very healthy discussions while um, you know, it's not a binding vote or anything like that. Um, all of it was unanimous as we went through uh, the legislative committee. And um, in terms of the recommendations, the committee is actually matching all of the IASB recommendations this time, which usually doesn't happen, but this time it did. And certainly, um, as we get into the consent agenda, if anyone has anything they'd like to pull off separately, that, that is permissible. Uh, but if anyone has any questions about the dialogue that we had as a committee, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. So it seems like um, in the past we've had a little bit um, of some more controversial um, resolutions on the list here. Um, and we have, like you said, we have seen some misalignment between what the IASB is recommending and what our committee eventually recommended. So I guess around <laughs> any of these items, would you describe any of the kind? Would you describe? Would you say there's any friction among the committee in terms of um, coming to consensus on on any of the issues? Yeah, I, I would say there were two kind of talking points this year. Um, first, there's a lot of wishes from member districts that the State Board of Education or the state would find money to grant things to districts. And, and I think there was um, some healthy skepticism on the community about whether or not it's even worth going along with the recommendation because the state would never do that anyway. Like, so you've got a couple on there like, we want increased funding for safety in schools or we want increased funding for construction in schools. And, and I think given the state's track record, several members expressed their, you know, is, is this really ever going to happen? Um, but we, um, having said that, the members of the committee, uh, the majority of them did not want to be in a position of not being in favor of the state giving school districts grants for construction for obvious reasons or, or safety. Um, in the past, there have been, well, the most controversial one since I've been a superintendent in the state of Illinois is whether or not staff should be armed and whether or not that should be something that the IASB should actively lobby. Um, that did not make it through this year, so that was not one that we discussed. There was one that we spent some time discussing, and that was whether or not a um, licensed gun dealership, which we don't have any here in District 58, uh, should be 500 feet from a school or 1,500 feet from a school. Um, Mundelein School District was recommending that it be 1,500 feet from a school. The ISB didn't support that, not because they favor having gun dealerships near schools, but in this particular resolution, they wanted to know, is there truly a difference in, in student safety between 500 and 1,500 feet? Where do they get that 1,500 feet? Why not 2,000? Why not 5,000? And so there was some talk about that. Um, and then ultimately, they also um, wanted to know, you know, how many school districts find themselves in this position and what happens to those businesses that are already established? Does that mean they close, which could jeopardize um, tax revenue and things like that? So we spent some time talking about that. Uh, but for the most part, um, they, they were pretty quick conversations this year. Another one that we talked about was Naperville School District 203 was recommending that the state provide uh, funding for electric school buses. Uh, Naperville, unlike District 58, is a district that has its own busing, and so they're advocating for um, getting grants for the state. Um, several districts, including 58, would take issue with that because we're not getting grants because we contract that out, and the state is not living up to its transportation needs right now, so why would we shift to something else? Um, not a green energy argument, but why would we subsidize other districts when some districts aren't getting that? And so that was a conversation that we had as well. 
But I think that, that summed up the conversation uh, that we have. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions from the board? Mm -hmm. Okay. That brings us to the Financial Advisory Committee, which met last Thursday, November 10th. Um, in that particular meeting, uh, we reviewed the year-to-date report, as we always do, and uh, went through a little bit more detail on the playground update that's attached mm -hmm. uh, in your, um, in, on the, on the uh, board book this evening, for anyone who hasn't seen it. Um, we did welcome Mr. Coyne again from Oppenheimer to kind of help walk through the, the, some of the bond process, because we did go through a lot of detail and talk about what those bond issuances could look, you know, what they look like, what that process looks like. Um, the FAC has been a really good sounding board kind of throughout this whole process of, of how this thing works, kind of a nice uh, check and balance uh, uh, during, uh, during this process and just a lot of questions about timing and, and how, you know, and how that process is gonna work. It was a, um, it was a really good conversation on there, uh, as well as discussing the fact that we're gonna go out to both S&P and Moody's to get another bond rating. Um, we used to only, you know, previously for small measures, we've had one, but when we did the, our last bond rating, we did get two as well to start establishing a little bit of history uh, with both. And now we'll, we'll go back out to both again before we go out uh, to market. As well as we did a kind of a final review, uh, the FAC had been involved in the recommendation to go with a contract management firm um, and, and go with that at-risk model that we talked about previously. So we spent a little bit of time just talking about that contract as well uh, in, in that process that we would go through. The final piece we did talk about is, uh, in, in the meeting was uh, we are getting to the point where we're coming up to the tax levy. That'll come up next month. Uh, as many of you know, CPI is well above the cap that has been set for our district as we are tax capped at 5%. Well, when you, when you hit that, tap, uh, that, that cap, we are required um, to have a uh, truth in taxation uh, hearing. So that will happen next month uh, when that comes forward. So that, you know, we've had those, uh, we've had those before. Uh, we just opened up the meeting at the beginning. So uh, with that, I, uh, I, will, I will go to Member Olchek and see if I missed anything. No, not nothing missed. I just think, you know, great, great dialogue. And, and I think, you know, kind of where we're at is even more great dialogue. Like, how do we kind of move past this referendum and continue to, tap into that expertise that's in that room. So I think uh, future dialogue is going to be even uh, more engaging and, and we're definitely going to capitalize with the, the great expertise that, that volunteer for that committee. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, with that, that includes my report, but I'll take any questions. Uh, Darren, I have just one. Can you, I've seen a little um, chatter in the community about this at risk and I know we've talked about it before. Would you mind explaining one more go what the at risk is in the in the setup of the bullying sure and i will let it, i mean because i know it's it yeah. sounds scarier than it actually yes. is in it's reality actually the because we've actually yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. it has the opposite meaning of what the title is so i think it, it absolutely would behoove I, us to again just clarify one yeah, more time you, what that means in the briefest piece is that they um the contract the contract management firm holds all the sub they mm -hmm. it's all bid it all still has to be approved. The board has to approve that. But they will hold the contracts of the subcontractors, and, and they will verify the insurance piece and that uh, all of those um, meet the criteria and so forth, as opposed to the district uh, taking on that, that responsibility liability. Mm -hmm. um, that's really the difference. Anything I'm missing? <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're yeah. passing yeah. on that, that liability sense. primarily. Yeah. And then the other component is, is uh, having them own a lot of this process. Sometimes when you don't go at risk, you literally will bring on another person internally to just kind of help manage through that process. Um, this this kind of takes that pressure off of us internally and allows the experts kind of to help us through the process because this is a uh, this is a much larger project than we as a district are, are used to working with. Thank you. And yeah. to clarify, I understood what at risk meant yes. just for the community <laughs> to know. <Yeah. laughs> I understood it, but I just wanted to make sure that it was really, you know, revisited again because now that we're voting on it, I think it's important to just a absolutely clarify that. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? All right. Thank you. Uh, that brings us to the district leadership team who did not meet, neither did health and wellness. So uh, we have no discussion items tonight. So that brings us on to the public comment portion of the meeting. Uh, you want to check the basket to see if we have any public comments? 
Um, this is the opportunity for members of the audience to share in public comment with the board, but is not intended for a time for members of the audience to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issued raised tonight during public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff when appropriate. The board has allocated 30 minutes tonight for public comment, but we ask everyone to keep it to a three minute limit to allow everyone an opportunity to speak. At this time, did we receive any cards? No cards. We do not have any cards, so I will, uh, since we do have the time allotted, I will check and see if there is anyone here tonight that did not leave a card but would like to leave a public comment. All right. Um, all right, that brings us down to the approval of minutes. Are there any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? All right, if not, is there a motion to approve the minutes of the October 11th, 2022 regular meeting as presented? So moved. Second. Second. All right, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carried to approve the minutes of the October 11th, 2022 regular meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the October 24th, 2022 curriculum workshop as presented? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carried. I have to abstain, sorry. Oh, oh. That was there. No problem. <laughs> uh, motion carried to approve the minutes of the October 24th, 2022 <laughs> curriculum workshop as presented. All right, first up is the consent agenda. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? Um, President Hughes, I'd like to consider item C separately. Okay, Member Harris uh, is asking for the IASB resolutions to be uh, voted on separately. Anything else? All right, and there, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements, which consists of the list of bills and summary? Um, Looking for a motion? Oh, oh so, so moved. moved. Second. All right. Uh, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Weiner? Aye. Member Ellis? Aye. Member Hannes? Aye. Member Harris? Aye. Member Olchick? Aye. Member Hughes? Aye. The motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. That brings us up to the first recommend item which is now the 2022 IASB recommendations are there any resolutions a board member would like to have considered separately I would like to consider number three so. number three anyone else okay. then is there a motion to approve the positions of each resolution in the 2022 resolution committee report as presented in the attached spreadsheet with the exception of resolution number three and direct the IASB delegate Emily Hannes to cast her vote accordingly on behalf of district 58. So moved. Second. Second. All right, any discussion? Yeah, I just want to explain why I, I pulled this. And I, I was unaware that you were going to want to talk about number three separately, so I'm glad I did that. Um, the, the reason why is uh, since I've been on the board, this was something that we just kind of approved that really thinking about and then that kind of set us up for some trouble maybe four or five years ago when we had an issue and we, so we had we had a debate back and forth about like where, where is the recommend, recommendation for these um, these resolutions come from is that coming from the committee or is it, and, and the board is rubber stamping that or is, is the board in the driver's seat so we've had a lot of good conversations and we've had a lot of controversial conversations mm -hmm. this year thankfully everything is very vanilla um, but I did not want to um, miss an opportunity to make sure that we are um, kind of we are all kind of on the record on this issue, and that we um, are at least making sure that we're talking about it, and not just rubber stamping something. So that's mm -hmm. why I wanted to vote on, on the whole in, in entirety separately, and, and I'm happy to talk about number three as well separately. Okay. And any discussion on number three would be when that item uh, comes up. Um, but uh, any other questions on on the other ones besides number three? No. All right, uh, since you did call this separately, I can do this as just a all in favor vote, but did you want it to be a roll call vote? No. Okay. Same time. All right, then all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the motion carried to approve the uh, positions on each resolution in the 2022 resolutions committee report as presented in the spreadsheet with the exception of resolution number three and direct the IASB delegate Emily Hannes to cast her vote accordingly on behalf of District 58. Now I'm looking for a motion regarding resolution number three. Um, uh, I don't know if I need to read the resolution. Uh, is the mo is right motion here. going to be a, to approve it or to not approve it? So the ISB is recommending that this not get adopted. So then, so, so then if a vote for yes would be to not adopt. Well, it depends on what Member Hannes is proposing. Is she? Is she? Is her? Is her uh, um, motion to 
adopt. The motion was to take it separately. So uh, the recommendation that came in with on the board tonight is to uh, a yes vote would mean to recommend not to adopt. If you if you want to adopt it, you would vote no. So I just need to hear the, the, the language of the, of the right. Yeah. Just of to ask motion. for her motion. Mm -hmm. Oh, you want me to? Yeah. So oh, she oh. should have a motion to oh, either okay. adopt I, or I not see. adopt. All right. So then I just need the dialogue for you. Yes. How, how you how would you, you would like to present the motion? Yeah. Well, the, I mean, my understanding is that the motion is the committee was recommending to not adopt that particular resolution. Um, I just wanted to separate that from the rest so that we could discuss that one separately and have a vote on that one individual item separate from the others. So do you want a motion? Committee's recommendation. Do you just want the motion then to be, number three, um, is the motion then to support the ISB to not adopt the fire alarm dealer location resolution? And then- That's not what I want the motion to be. But I that understand. Is that how you want the language to be in a no vote would sure. mean yes? Or, or do you want me to flip so, it and, no, vote and ask it the other way? No, I would say it makes more sense to keep, keep the it language aligned, so aligned with the other Vote okay. on the so your motion other. is to adopt the the resolution from Mundelein CHSD mm -hmm. District 210. Yes, I think what I'm. But what she's saying is she wants to leave it the language. She's wanting to vote to not adopt it, but she's saying the motion that she's saying for lack of confusion. I think you it might make it. more sense to keep the language the same as the language we voted on you on the previous and that's one. To, you can't vote against And I can just vote against No, we, you can, if you're motioning, I need you to vote in the affirmative. In favor of the So motion. I will, okay, so I will then, flip yes. that, okay? Yes, so then I would like so to motion, motion to adopt to Mundelein's adopt. resolution. And so, uh, can we discuss prior to it? That yeah, would be yeah. moving. And I'll give my what? explanation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that would be moving it from 500 number feet to 1,500 yes. feet. Number three. So, my rationale. We need a second. Oh, I hold on one second. I, let me read the motion. Yeah, All right. Is there a motion regarding resolution number three to adopt the resolution <coughs> to support legislation to increase the distance of a gun store or any facility? Um, selling firearms or ammunition to be located in relation to the school from 500 feet to 1500 feet um, and that is brought forward by Mundelein uh, school district 210 is there a motion so moved second okay now we can discuss it yeah. okay so my rationale behind this um, my decision to, to take this position as a school district and as a board one of our ultimate priorities is the safety and security of our students, of course. Um, in my view, this is very reasonable, rational, common sense type of um, potential for legislation down the road should you know, that be what Illinois decides to do, that moving gun dealerships, places that are selling guns and ammunition and things, farther away from schools just makes reasonable logical sense in my view in terms of safety and security of students obviously i understand where the iasb committee and our legislative committee um comes in terms of you know data and, and how do we support how do we determine how far and how far is far enough and i understand all of that but ultimately at the end of the day i also think when you're talking about 500 feet that's really close <laughs> like that's really close to a school and if that was one of our schools and granted you know we mentioned oh well there's no there's none of this in Downers Grove well okay but we never know when that could change and I also think you know as ed as educators and promoters of public education we need to be thinking um, kind of more big picture on especially on, on something as important as this and so um, there's lots of other examples of legislation that's passed that's specific to school districts and like for example school speed zone laws that are in place you know they determined at some point in time when was a reasonable distance to say this many you know x number of blocks from a school we're going to have a school speed zone mm -hmm. and we're going to put a law in place that says that if you're you know the speed zone is different within those x number of blocks from a school for the safety of students involved i don't think this is all that different from that i think yes are there um specifics that would be worked out and you know like Kevin mentioned okay you have one that's already in place and they have been you know legally you know abiding by all the rules and all those kinds of things how do, how do we factor that all in 
yes, those are issues that would need to be addressed and worked out and things like that. But ultimately, I think as a as a school board, we should be supporting um, anything that's going to help promote safety and security of our students to the utmost level that we possibly can. And I don't think 1,500 feet from a school is unreasonable. So. Dr. Rose, would you mind just rehashing um, the rationale for why the IASB is not recommending adopting this and why our legislative committee uh, um, ultimately leaned towards not adopting this? Yeah, so it's, it's always hard to, you know, because we're not in the room when the ISB is making this, we're, we're reading it, right? Um, I think both the ISB, though, and the committee agree with everything that Emily said. I, I, I don't think it's a matter of mm -hmm. no one wanting more safety in, I, I don't never want to use a word like indifferent, but I think the reason why the committee said we'll go along with the ISB was to send a signal back to Mundelein we support this, but let's get a little bit more specific about implementation, what this would look like, some of the research behind that, and then we can support it. And so that was really the only hang up in, in why I think the ISB did not move completely forward with this. Um, and uh, so that's what the committee was, was really talking about and looking for. But in terms of school safety and proximity and all that, I, I don't think there was any disagreement with what Emily um, had shared. So if this were to move forward, um, you know, the board would, would vote with Emily and, and um, you know, take this recommendation. I, I, I don't think that the committee would be angry with that a, a, at all. Um, but I do think we would have to go to ISB and say, okay, let, let's get some more specifics in here um, if you're going to go lobby uh, on behalf of this new legislation. And there, there was another one, I'm not going to remember the, which one it was last year, where it, was, it made a lot of sense. I remember having a good lively debate about it, but we, at the end of the day, the ISB and our committee felt like it was kind of half baked. Yeah, so that, that, one, that one was um, about gun storage. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that I wish that would have come back on right now, I think we were all nervous about, well, why should school board be in people's homes and all that? And we wanted a little bit more of the research. I would tell you, Glenn Ellen 41, who brought that up when I attended um, the League of Women Voter session, they came back with the research and talked about how if you have this legislation, how it does impact school shootings and how it does reduce the number of fatalities in school. So if they would have brought that back, I, I think you would have had a lot more support for that where a year ago it was a little more cloudy. So I think we're in a very similar situation with this one as well this school year. But again, I don't think anyone on the committee would disagree with what Emily shared. Mm -hmm. I guess my concern, because uh, I, don't, I don't think uh, gun dealers belong near a school either in the same way that we've heard conversations around that with uh, you know marijuana dispensaries and, and other stuff as well I do worry that this is an arbitrary kind of num I'm, I'm wondering if, that, if it seems like it would have been a, a slam dunk easy thing for the IASB to support if there was maybe if it was fully formed I'm just wondering if that's maybe what like hearing you makes me wonder if it's just not ready for, for prime time yet is this the argument to go it were, you know is this somebody going after something specific and maybe a, a actual bigger research has to be done or are we supporting something that actually makes logical logical sense I mean 500 feet does seem close I mean certainly you know, in, in, in I, but do we have any idea how many school districts have begun to go well, I, I think when you look at, at, at downwards, because we have neighborhood schools and our schools are in neighborhoods where they're zoned, you're, you're not going to see businesses like this, right? And, and I would have a hard time believing a village council would pass a, a different zoning to allow a, a business to open up th across the street from El Sierra, right, or, or another school like that. Um, however, certainly this is a case in Mundelein, right, because that's why they brought this forward. That, that's what they're trying to prevent. It's always tough because Illinois is just such a diverse state and zoning laws vary between municipalities. This could be a reality in some towns where some towns are worried about losing a local business or may have a different, you know, um, take on guns or, or whatever the case may be. Um, so again, the, the committee conversation we just wanted some more information about what this would look like and, and, and how this law would be implemented. It wasn't about, you know, we, you know, aren't concerned about gun violence or anything like that in our schools. Well, I think, Darren, to your point, one of the hard parts about it is, like you said, you know, without the data to support it, how do you know? Or, or maybe we just need to have this more fully formed before we can get behind it. But I think also part of it is if there's never if we never like put any pressure, so to speak, on issues like this, do they always just like linger and nothing ever gets done? Whereas if you get 
a lot of support behind something, you're kind of forcing the hand of lawmakers to come up with the solutions and to come up with the, okay, let's, let's really dig in and research and figure this out, what is gonna be most effective? And if that pressure is never there, maybe those things will never come to be. If we never put the pressure, it's kind of what came first, chicken or the egg type of argument sometimes, I think, so that's, you know, part of my rationale too. Well, and to kind of play into your argument then as well, because this is a lobbying side of the IASB, mm -hmm. this is not written legislation. Mm -hmm. By lobbying specifically for 1,500 feet, we could also make the argument that the pressure that you put on, it may not come to 1,500 feet, it may come to 3,000, or it may come to 750, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but uh, potentially you're opening up uh, conversation. The conver and conversation. On, and, you yeah. know, some of the ones that we talk about seem so. I mean, this one feels specific, and I think that's what makes it a, a, a challenge sometimes, unless I know it's going to do. But, but like, sometimes it, it, it's hard. Now, this one I think could kind of go either way that you could you could spark a conversation and maybe do something, even if mm -hmm. it doesn't look like what Mundelein is is, um, is requesting. But, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's hard I, I, in, in these particular things because yeah. I don't know that I. I Without knowing what we know, it's hard to have a real strong opinion on what you're sort of advocating for you know, right. to begin with. Right. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I agree with, with what I'm saying, but Epson, I, I really don't, I didn't come to this, this meeting prepared to, to discuss this, so I, I, I don't know if I, ha if I feel strong about this either, either way to, to either support our committee or, or, or support our committee and the ISB or to buck our committee and, and the ISB. So, um, yeah, I think it's just, it's just a half. It's a half-baked idea that just needs a little bit more, more time to be fleshed out um, before we can understand like how it's going to impact our schools and how it's going to impact our communities. Any other comments from other board members? Or? Well, I, I want to make uh, one thing clear that's in the law, the ILCS, is that it's none, n no newly established mm -hmm. firearm or gun dealer within 500 feet. So it would grandfather in those already existing. So the law itself says no newly established. For, for that reason, I would that's, support. That's what they're advocating for? That's, no, that's what 40, 40 ILCS but that states. That doesn't mean, that doesn't say that's gonna be newly established gun dealers. No, 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 but they're, they're asking to change that particular, when you go to the ISB, IAS, this is just a. This is our This, is our this is just our sure. spreadsheet, yeah. Mm -hmm. When you go to the actual yeah, right, one, the, they reference the, the law and the yeah, law. The manual, yeah. yeah, you follow the breadcrumbs through the, the law and the law says, no newly established. So they're advocating for that 500 feet to change to 1,500 feet in the law, right? And it states um, in the law, no newly established. Okay. So Mundelein, when they came up okay. with this, mm -hmm. is tying it back to that existing law that you're talking about? Correct. Okay. Yeah, so that was my understanding of how this was written. Okay. Um, and so when you go that deep down, and unfortunately I wasn't able to attend the legislative mm -hmm committee meeting. I had COVID, oddly, in October of 2022. Um, so I wasn't able to attend that one, but had I attended, I probably would have brought that point forward um, because I think that that is a pretty key um, fact here that I don't know if it was or was not considered by the ISB committee, mm -hmm. um, but it's one that I would have considered had I been on that committee and had I made it to this legislative committee meeting and had my input there. Okay. Um, so for that reason, I'll be supporting I'm on this one. And, and just to be clear, if the board, you know, goes in a different direction from the committee, that is something we're yeah. always very clear about with every one of our committees that the ultimate decision rests with the school board, and sometimes the school board um, will uh, bring up points that perhaps the committee didn't consider. And, and, and so, again, I don't think you're going to have people all of a sudden jump off of committee saying if no. you're not going to support this, uh, this is not the one. I, I, I think again. To summarize the committee, it was more of, let's just get some more information before we move forward with this. I, I think hearing the conversation here, if the board decides to go in a different direction, I, I really don't think you're gonna get um, a lot of upset customers, if that makes sense. If you want to see. Any other last minute uh, comments or suggestions? So how, how is it going if to If you vote yes, we, we, we're supporting, the, we're recommending that they adopt. If we say no, we're recommend, no, yes. If we say yes, Correct. it's recommending to adopt. Correct. If it's no, it's, we're recommending that they don't adopt. So it's backwards from the committee you recommendation. Yes, you're supporting what I'm proposing. I say yes. How do, how do we know if, if you say no, then you're going, going with what the legislative committee proposed. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. okay. How do we know the intention of, of the resolution is to? All right. Melissa, because they go to put the word in. Anything else? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Hannes. Aye. 
Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Nay. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried. Uh, let's, I gotta go back and read this again. Uh, to adopt the resolution for number three to recommend um, that the IASB adopt um, supporting legislation to increase distance from a gun store event or any facility selling firearms or ammunition um, that may be located in relation to a school from 500 feet to 1,500 feet. <coughs> okay. Next up is a resolution for the issuance of $179 million in general, op in general obligation school bonds. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution providing for the issue of not to exceed $179 million of general obligation school bonds of the district for the purpose of altering, repairing, or equipping school buildings providing for the levy of a direct annual tax sufficient to pay the principal and interest on said bonds and authorizing the sale of said bonds to the purchaser thereof? So moved. Second. Any discussion on that? We can come back to it. You better did all the readings. We might want that. Oh yeah, I'll do that one next. <laughs> uh, what do we need? A second. We've got so one. Second. Okay. All right. Cool. Wait, do we do both? Do, do you have a, a motion and a second? And I do. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Any discussion? No. All right. Melissa, please cover. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to adopt the resolution providing the issue of not to exceed $179 million of general obligation school bonds of the district for the purposes of altering, repairing, or equipping school buildings, providing for the levy of a direct annual tax sufficient to pay the principal and interest of said bonds, and authorizing the sale of, the, of said bonds to the purchaser thereof. Next up is a resolution for the issuance of $3 million taxable general obligation limited tax refunding bonds. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution providing for the issuance of, uh, or the issue of not to exceed $3 million taxable general obligation limited tax refunding bonds of the district for the purposes of refunding certain outstanding bonds, providing for the levy of a direct annual tax to pay the principal and interest of said bonds and authorizing the sale of said bonds to the purchaser thereof? So moved. Second. <laughs> All right, any discussion on that one? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to adopt the resolution providing for the, uh, the issue of not to exceed $3 million in taxable general obligation limited tax refunding bonds of the district for the purpose of refunding certain outstanding bonds providing for the levy of a direct annual tax to pay the principal and interest of said bonds and authorizing the sale of said bonds to the purchase thereof. Is there a motion now to adopt the American Education Week resolution as presented? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion on that? All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, the motion carried to adopt the American Education uh, Week resolution. All right, and last up is the construction management contract. Is there a motion to approve the construction management contract with Bully and Andrews as presented? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? I just have one thing that's not going to derail <laughs> anything, I promise. Okay. Um, ongoing, we've talked a little bit about what our expectations are going to be on a go forward, and I know that we have some representatives in the room, I can see. <laughs> um, so for me, as we go forward through the architecture plans and the awarding to contractors and subcontractors. Um, I think it's incredibly important that we keep our eye on, and for those that are gonna be on the DLT and the FAC working on this on the board, um, that we keep our eye on um, our contractors and subcontractors having the proper certifications for the materials that they are installing. Um, it's not required by law to have those kinds of certifications, but it will help with timeline and cost. Um, and will help us with not having a lot of rework having to be done if things are done incorrectly the first time. So I just want everyone to pay close attention to that, please, on an ongoing basis. But I read through all of these very lengthy uh, documents. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for all your hard work on them um, to the team that worked on them, because I know that there was a lot done on these. Yeah. Thank you.
All right, anything else? Any other comments or questions? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Uh, the motion carried to approve the construction management contract with Bully and Andrews as presented. We do have some representatives, some Bully and Andrews. Uh, if you'd like to come up and just introduce yourselves, then uh, you can meet the board. <laughs> I figure since we're going to be working very closely for yeah. several years, it might be a good opportunity uh, for a quick hello. I imagine it won't be the last time. Hi. Uh, my name's Tim Pantilla. I'm Chief Operating Officer with Bully & Andrews. I've been there uh, for 26, 27 years. Um, you know, we're a 131-year-old firm, so I'm just a young pup there. Uh, but we're super excited to be working with you all and, uh, on this exciting project. Um, and that's about it. Thank you very Thank much you. for coming. Thank you so much. We look forward to working with you. All right, a couple of announcements. Uh, the district leadership team will meet at O'Neill Middle School on Monday, November 21st at 3.45 p.m. And we have a curriculum workshop coming up later on in the month at O'Neill Middle School on Monday, November 21st at 7 p.m. All right, the board will now move into closed session to, uh, to confidentially dis uh, is, is there a motion to move into closed session to uh, discuss the placement of individual students in special education programs and other matters related to individual students. That's 5 ILCS 122C10. And the discussion of minutes of meetings lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act, whether for the purposes of the approval of the body of minutes or the semi-annual review of minutes, is mandated by Section 2.06. That's 5 ILCS 122C21. So moved. Second. All right. Melissa, oh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, the motion carried. We will now move into closed session after a short recess. It's 8.40 p.m. I will see you at 8.45.